awakening in our country to the persistent reality of racial injustice. This awakening has been mirrored in God's church at First Presbyterian St. Petersburg. After that tragedy, a social justice subtask force functioning under the missions committee was established by the session. Additionally, two of our adult Sunday school classes have also been reading and discussing books related to faith and social justice. I am so very grateful to the leadership of our Christian education moderator, Kyle Brinkman, who has organized this series for the willingness of Unita Brewer to chair the social justice subcommittee and for the collaboration between the faith journey class and the social justice committee that brings us this series. As we get started and before I turn this over to our um, CE moderator, Kyle, I invite you to join me in prayer. We thank you, oh God, that we are together in this time and place, aware of your presence and grateful for the fellowship that we have with one another because of your love for us. May we be open to one another and to hearing and responding to you. And now we commit unto you the work of this series praying that what we do with what we learn shall be done to your name's honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, the overview for tonight, uh, we just had our opening prayer, I'll be going through the rules uh, for how we conduct our Zoom meeting. Um, Unita will tell us about the, uh, the task force that uh, is formed at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, at which point uh, I will introdu introduce tonight's speaker. Um, uh, Ray will have some uh, time to, uh, to go over his subject matter. Hopefully we have time remaining for some questions and answer. Uh, and then we'll have a closing prayer. All right, so you know, uh, again, uh, this session is being recorded at this moment. Uh, if you are not uh, speaking, uh, please mute your microphone. Uh, and I ask that once the speaker is introduced, that we allow him to speak. Uh, please do not interrupt uh, during the uh, presentation. Uh, there will be a time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, when we get to the questions and answers, uh, please use the raise hand uh, uh, feature of Zoom. Um, and I'll point that out here in a second. Also, uh, since Zoom shows everyone's window, uh, I would like you to um, take a look at the speaker view so that the person who is talking takes up the majority of your window. Uh, those controls. Uh, over on the left side, you have your mute button, uh, the little uh, um, microphone. The speaker view can be accessed by a little uh, icon in the upper right corner uh, where you can change the view. The uh, reaction button will bring up uh, this little um, icons uh, where you can raise your hand uh, and raising your hand will allow somebody who's looking at the participant list to see that you would like to speak and we can call upon you for your questions. Okay, um, and that should be fairly easy. Again, uh, during the uh, presentation, please uh, mute your uh, microphone uh, so that the audio quality is good for all the participants. About the series, uh, the, the, uh, the theme and agenda of the series is really pretty simple. Uh, it comes from the Sermon on the Mount uh, where Jesus pronounced uh, blessings on various people. And at the end, the peacemakers. Uh, the peacemakers are supposed to be the children of God. That's supposed to be us. Uh, in order for us to do that, we should understand uh, the others who uh, received God's blessing. Uh, the poor in spirit, the meek, those who mourn, uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, so that's what this is about. Uh, some of the material that we'll be touching on uh, could include homelessness, could include um, poverty, um, reintegration of um, felons, um, uh, LGBTQ uh, issues, and other uh, issues in our country, in our city, uh, where justice needs some work. Uh, so we'll be uh, talking about those things in this series. And we've got a slate of uh, speakers uh, that we're uh, 
pursuing, uh, and they'll be announced as, uh, as we're able to do so. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Yanita uh, to talk about the task force. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks everybody. This is going to just be a brief overview because we wanna to get to Ray and to your questions. As Pastor said, the task force was formed out of the concerns that arose with the, the murder of George Floyd and then other um, issues of social injustice. And we work as a subcommittee of the mission committee. Next slide. Currently, uh, we're very small. Uh, you can see the names of people and we wanna acknowledge Tara Dozark, especially because Tara actually talked to Pastor Dawn initially about what we might do. And out of her concern, um, it spread to the mission committee and now to a, a task force. We leave a space for you because if you are interested in these issues or concerns, or you have some ideas, we invite you to be a part of it and let us know. Uh, you, you can contact me and um, I will give you my um, contact information in chat. Next slide. I'm going to enlarge a little bit on this slide um, because Pastor Don actually sent some additional information that um, I did not get to Kyle, but I will tell you. Social justice in the secular sense is political and philosophical. And it says that everybody, all of us on the call and those born and unborn, when they get here, should have equal access to wealth. And when we think about wealth, we don't just mean rich, we mean economic stability and all that goes to make that happen to health. And in this time of the pandemic, we can see with our own eyes the uneven um, um, toll that the pandemic has taken on, on communities of color, especially African Americans and Latino, and on the distribution of the vaccine. And so social justice says, wait a minute, we need to rectify that. Why is that? on well-being, which includes not just health, but emotional and uh, spiritual well-being. Justice, both in the sense of how we treat people who have committed crimes and the fact that we need to be, um, to, to treat everyone when they come to the justice system in a fair and just way. And then opportunity, whether you wanna be um, a business person or run a nonprofit, or be a religious scholar or a teacher, preacher, whatever you wanna to be to have opportunity for that. And Jesus's view of social justice is even more encompassing because when our Lord began his ministry, he set the tone for his ministry by quoting the Isaiah scroll, which said, and you can see this with me, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. That's from Isaiah and Jesus read it from the scroll in Luke. And then after he sat down, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes, making plain that he is the one who came to bring this good news and to set us all free. Next slide. In the current day, the Presbyterian Church USA through the mission agency is pursuing a Matthew 25 vision of social justice by focusing on three initiatives and invites all congregations, all Presbyterian congregations all over the world to focus on building congregational vitality, dismantling structural racism, and eradicating systemic poverty. And why Matthew 25? Because the scripture reference is Matthew 25. It's actually 31 through 46, where Jesus responds uh, to people when he says, you fed me when I was hungry. You gave me water when I was thirsty. You took care of me when I was sick. You visited me. And they say, we didn't do that. When did we do that? 
And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, and we are the least of these, everyone in this planet, we are the least of these, because he says, when you did it to these, my brothers, you did it to me. So we have a command to respond. And so that's what we are doing as a committee. Next slide. And we've decided that we'd like to organize ourselves to share with the congregation in this way, to educate, just as Kyle said, so we can understand the issues and the challenges because it's vast, then to empower through collaboration among many people and groups in the church to take action and to sustain it so that we bring about the beloved community. Then when we sustain it, that we have systems that make it possible for us to keep um, justice rolling down and then to evaluate how are we doing and if we need to change something to change it. So I think there's one more slide and then I'll be done. We are partnering in this first stage with the Faith Journey Sunday School class and Wednesday Night Live and also with Contemporary Faith and next time we'll be hearing more about their journey in social justice. But our first step is education and so we're delighted that Ray is here to begin that with us. And if you want to um, sign up or at least talk, I will put my information in chat right now. And thank you very much and I turn it back over to Kyle. All right. So tonight uh, we have the pleasure of hearing from uh, Professor Arsenault. Uh, Ray is a church member and familiar to many of the attendees here tonight. Uh, he has recently retired from USF uh, uh, St. Petersburg after 41 years. He's been uh, 22 years as a John Hope Franklin Professor of Southern History, author of uh, 10 books, including uh, St. Petersburg and the Florida Dream, uh, the Freedom Riders, 1961, and the Struggle for Racial uh, Justice, uh, The Sound of Freedom, um, Marian Anderson, The Lincoln Memorial and the Concert that uh, Awakened America, um, a biography on Arthur Ashe, and currently writing a book, a biography of the civil rights icon, uh, John Lewis. All right, at this point, I'll be turning it over to Ray and asking that uh, everyone be sure to mute your microphones, uh, raise your hands uh, in the Q&A uh, period. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Kyle uh, and Unita for the invitation uh, to kick off this social justice series. Uh, I really feel honored. Uh, I, I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful success. Um, it's a great, a great thing for you to do. I, I just learned earlier today that St. Peter's Church, Episcopal Church, is doing a similar series, and uh, they, they've asked me to speak at that one as well. Um, and I think it's sort of fitting that we are beginning with our local community and the black community within that larger community. Uh, the, um, when historians look at things like this, um, uh, well, let me, let me begin a little framing just to, to help you understand what I'm gonna try to do in the next few minutes. Uh, that there's, there's external kind of relational history and there's internal history. Uh, there's, uh, so that black history involves more than race relations. I mean, I think there was a time when, when we really didn't fully appreciate that, when most of the studies of African-American life were studies of race relations and whites played as large a part on that as blacks. But I think now we have more balance. So there are complementary stories. Um, there are stories of, of racial discrimination and, and oppression and then resistance and sometimes acquiescence uh, to those things. And then there's the kind of internal community life and, and culture. Uh, uh, so uh, I think one of the things we need to remember, which is often forgotten, is that even oppressed peoples, even slaves, people at the bottom of the ladder, so to speak, have historical agency. They make decisions that affect their lives, even though they may not have as much power or 
as many degrees of freedom or latitude as people who were better off. Uh, um, so there's a, a text and a context to looking at the history of, of race and civil rights in any particular community. The, the first thing I would say is that every community is distinctive, uh, uh, including its racial and civil rights history. Uh, historians of, of this sometimes talk about Jim Crow and racism as a shape-shifting monster. And what we mean by that is in, in, you, may, you may have a handle on what it's like in one community and then you go 10 miles down the road and the situation is different. Uh, so we can't make too many assumptions about the consistency of, of race and racism and the reaction of, of, of communities. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit in a minute about the general history of St. Petersburg very briefly, because I think it's so intimately connected uh, with the history of the black community here and the history of civil rights here. Uh, this, the first thing I'd say is, which is not always, always appreciated, I think, by people who live here, is that blacks have played a large role in the city's history and continue to do so uh, today. There are more than 60,000 blacks in the city Roughly 23% of the population of St. Petersburg is African-American. However, throughout most of the city's history, that role in the city's history played by blacks was, was circumscribed by, by racial segregation, particularly the, the Jim Crow system of racial separation. Uh, there was a, the system was the result of deliberate public policy and social and structural design. Uh, one of the classic examples, which I think we can all see is just the placement of uh, expressways. You may have noticed that these asphalt and concrete uh, barriers always seem to go right through the heart of, of black neighborhoods. Uh, just think about I-275 I and I-175 on the south side of St. Petersburg. They sort of wall off the communities. And this was no accident. This was a part of the urban planning of, of the day. Um, I would urge you uh, to, to see an example of this, to vi visit the Carter G. Woodson Museum, which is of course the, the previously was the community center of the Jordan Park um, public housing project. It's on 22nd Street and 9th Avenue South. It's a wonderful museum. I've been on the board since the very beginning and helped to create it. And, we're very proud of it, but it's it's right up against the expressway. Uh, you 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 get a real sense of of what that did to those to those uh, neighborhoods. You can also see the same thing if you visit Methodist Town, the area around Bethel AME Church, um, you know, just uh, Mar just off of Martin Luther King, and uh, and uh, just a few blocks uh, north of, of of Central. You can see that very clearly there. Okay. Um, I would also say, uh, I won't be able to go through uh, everything tonight for sure. It won't be comprehensive. There's not enough time, but uh, I would urge you when you get a chance to go down to the Woodson Museum and that, that's the beginning of the African-American Heritage Trail, which we, we uh, put up about, about four or five years ago. We had a city committee uh, Gwen Reese, who's kind of the unofficial historian of the black community here, was led the committee and I was on it. But anyway, we're very proud of it. There are about 20 historical markers at, along 9th Avenue South and 22nd Street and a lot of information on them. And it's one of the best trails of its kind, I think, in the United States. And I think it'll, it'll probably give you a great sense of the, some of the um, complexity of, of, of the history of the black community here. Um, before I talk about that, uh, I just want to say just a couple of things and some of this may be obvious to you and you already know it and please forgive me if I'm being repetitive. Some of you heard me speak before, but about, about the, the distinctive history of St. Petersburg itself as a city, um, which has had a great impact on the, the lives of African Americans as well as the other citizens. Um, among America's cities, St. Petersburg has a very unusual history. Um, and you can say the same for the black community as well. St. Petersburg essentially skipped the normal industrial stage that most cities went through. It's never been a city of smokestacks, uh, of industry. 
uh, early in its history, within a decade of its founding in 1888, uh, it became a tourist town with an economy dependent upon a, on a positive image. And that, I wanna stress that. Um, uh, the image has always been related to its physical beauty, to a salubrious climate, to a, an exotic and relaxed atmosphere that the city has tried to present. And the city, you know, it rests on a subtropical peninsula lined with mangroves and sandy beaches. Um, so I think it's, that's a big part of the city's image. It's very proud of it. And it's tried to, to make that the basis of its economy. Uh, despite the city's tradition of, of high pressure real estate, you know, the culture of the so-called sand merchants, which we're probably all familiar, particularly in the 1920s, um, uh, St. Petersburg has essentially been a place where you could escape the rat race, a place that offered a balance between relaxation and labor. In fact, the city pioneered the notion of active retirement and associated itself with an ethic that we sometimes refer to as the Florida dream. So it's not surprising that St. Petersburg was the first American city to hire a full-time public relations man, John Lodwick, in, in 1919. Um, now, the Chamber of Commerce doesn't like me to say this. Uh, I've said it a few times in the past, but uh, in a sense, St. Petersburg has become the largest unproductive city on earth. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. It's a sense that we've, we've, we've been able to balance a kind of leisure and, and enterprise and uh, where, whereas many cities have not been able to do that. So I, I think that's a, one of the most positive things you could say about the city. In fact, St. Petersburg was one of the first, what we now call Sunbelt cities, uh, oriented more towards consumption than production. And because of that, I think we attracted a population that was multi-regional. In a very real sense, the city has always been part Southern and connected to the legacy of the Old South and the Confederacy. Uh, but it's also always included a large number of Northerners and Canadians and Europeans. Um, even though it maintained from its, almost from its very beginning, uh, a rather oppressive system of cradle to grave uh, Jim Crow segregation, which was somewhat similar to other Southern cities. But the system here was uh, more open to challenge, I would say, and not quite as closed as it was in deep South cities like Birmingham or Greenville, South Carolina or uh, Atlanta or Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, St. Petersburg has always been a regional hybrid. Okay? To cite just one example, in 1892, the first mayoral election in the city pitted a man from Indiana against a man from Michigan. Okay? That, I think that tells you something. In fact, in the early part of the 20th century, the city's chapter of the, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was kind of the alumni version of the Union Army, was just as large as the chapter of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. In fact, they, they would always have brawls on the Washington's birthday celebrations about who had the right to carry their flag in the streets of St. Petersburg. Uh, quite a row in 1911 when the Confederates were kicked out and uh, all, all hell broke loose. Um, as you may know, the city has gone through a number of nicknames that uh, uh, the first one was Health City back in 1885. It was a doctor, W2 Van Bibber, who's had some real estate to sell on Pinellas Peninsula and he gave a talk in New Orleans at the medical convention. He said, if you're looking for a place where you can live, live, live to grow old and, and be sort of almost uh, in, uh, guaranteed longevity, I've got some property to sell you over across the Bug Gulf in the Pinellas Peninsula. And uh, it became known as Hell City even before it existed, which was really in 1888. Later, of course, it was the Sunshine City with the famous giveaway of the Evening Independent from 1910 on. Any day when the sun didn't shine, they'd give the paper away free. And between 1910 and 1986, uh, they averaged four days a year. Um, so it was quite amazing. And then of course, it was the city of green benches from 1916 on, kind of a symbol of hospitality for the city. Although as I'll point out in a minute, it was not a symbol of hospitality for the African-American population who were not a, not allowed by custom to sit on those benches unless they were women in uniform taking care of white children. Otherwise they were not, not welcome. Uh, there are other less favorable nicknames, of course, related to our 
position as a, a, a kind of a magnet for the elderly, uh, God's waiting room, the world's largest above ground graveyard, it's another one, the home of Denture World, the city where the average age is deceased, as one person put it. Now, I think we've, today, we sort of outlived those, those uh, characterizations. Uh, the average age of, of the city is uh, almost down to the national average, which was unthinkable 30 or 40 years ago. We've had a real kind of re youth rebellion. Well, all of this has had a profound impact on the city's black community. And I, I wanna talk about some of the distinctive characteristics just in general, because I may not get to all of this. Uh, the first one was, I think sometimes shocks people is that the average black family living here has lived here longer, much longer than the average white family. Uh, uh, the black community here has much deeper roots than any part of the white community. And I think because of that, African-American community here has a strong sense of community uh, rooted in, in family and in religion in its churches and, and in history. Um, and it's, it's really kind of noticeable. So they, so even though African-Americans have been discriminated against throughout the history, they have a sense of uh, ownership of the city because they've been here in many cases a long, long time. So that's the first most obvious thing. Actually, the black population goes back to 1868 uh, when John Donaldson uh, and, and she wasn't his wife then, Anna Germain, they both worked for a man named Lewis Bell in, in Alabama, Southern Alabama. And they came in 1868 and then uh, John and um, uh, his, his wife Anna married and they had 11 children and uh, lived here for the rest of the century. And uh, John Donaldson became, he was the only black for many, many years, for 20 years, the only black family. And uh, there was a kind of a pioneer frontier general equality. There was, there was, there were no segregation laws. There was no reason for people to be afraid of the black uh, population because it was so, so small. And John Donaldson earned a lot of respect, uh, became a landowner. His, his, actually his children, several of his children actually went to an integrated school in Gulfport in the middle of the 1880s. Um, no one thought much, much of it. But, but 20 years later in 1888, when the Orange Belt Railroad came in, which really established the city of St. Petersburg, um, uh, there were more than a hundred black workers who worked on the railroad. Uh, and uh, about a dozen of them initially in 1888 Stayed, stayed around after the railroad was completed. And they created a little community on 4th Avenue, it was now 4th Avenue South called Peppertown. And then a few years later, there was another black community, uh, a man named Cooper owned it, it was called Cooper's Quarters, which was essentially where Martin Luther King and between Central Avenue and, and 3rd and 4th uh, Avenue uh, South. Um, so you had a growing community. Uh, 1895, the first uh, uh, physical black church, Bethel AME, which is still there, it's not the same building, became the center of Methodist Town, which was the only black community north of Central Avenue. Um, but by 1900, the city was roughly 23%, between 20 and 23% black, pretty substantial. Uh, and uh, by 1910, that was the highest point, um, the, Black population was about 27% of, of the population. Now it was largely working class. Uh, these were essentially the people to a large extent who, who built the, built the, the city. Um, so the, but the, um, so there's, it's a, there's, a, there's a long history. That's the point I wanted to make. The second thing is that the emphasis on the tourist trade and the city's public image led to a sustained attempt to sanitize and whiten the downtown and the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, there was a sense where blacks were supposed to remain invisible uh, to the tourists and the winter, and the winter visitors. Uh, many of these tourists and winter visitors were from the North, uh, who, people who were unaccustomed to close physical contact with blacks. You may have heard the aphorism of the kind of the old saw that in the North, um, whites don't care with respect to blacks how high you go, just so long as you don't get too close. And in the South, it's often the reverse. Southerners, uh, they, they don't mind you coming close, but they don't want you to dare to grow, try to go too high. Okay, so that you find uh, 
residential patterns in Southern cities where there's quite a bit of mix between whites and blacks. Um, whereas in the North, uh, blacks tended to be more, more ghettoized and more, more, more separated. Um, so um, St. Petersburg, because of that Northern influence, because of the emphasis on the tourist trade and trying to keep the downtown white and uh, try to almost hide the, set, the uh, reality that this was a, a biracial Southern city, uh, we got a heightened and extreme form of physical separation. Uh, sociologists and historians compute something called a segregation index, which is determined by how many people live on a street where there's someone who has a race other than theirs. If you, if you use that index, St. Petersburg has one, tra tra traditionally has had one of the highest segregation indexes of any community in the United States. Um, one of the few cities that was more segregated in terms of physical terms uh, was Chicago, actually, which was probably the highest point. Uh, it's fascinating that if you look through the brochures that were distributed to sell the city in all those years, um, they always downsize the estimate of the city's black population, even though the leaders of the city knew full well that the census told them that the city was roughly a fifth or even a, four, a quarter uh, black they would always say the black community was 9% or less, 9% <laughs> or less. Again, they, they, they didn't want to associate uh, the city with places like Birmingham or Jackson, Mississippi. It was supposed to be rather a, a kind of subtrop subtropical destination. And that's why they tried desperately to hide the fact that blacks were a significant part of the city's history. So blacks were, 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 were here, um, during the day to clean the hotel rooms and serve as bellhops and uh, construction workers, but otherwise they were to be invisible. Uh, and there was really no acknowledgement, no public acknowledgement that they were essential to the construction trades or, or, uh, or that they had an established community life a few blocks from downtown. It was and, and the, the so-called black beach issue where, where blacks could swim was a huge controversy for several decades and part of the reason was they didn't want black children walking through the downtown with their bathing suits and their towels. Uh, that, that just spoiled the whole image that they wanted to, to convey um, to, uh, to the world. Um, and uh, when, after the municipal pier uh, was built, um, the so-called million dollar pier in 1926, uh, no black automobiles were allowed on the pier. That was a kind of a, a popular thing to do in St. Petersburg is to, on, on Sundays and Saturdays, to kind of drive the loop, kind of to cruise around the, around the pier. But uh, you were taking your life in your hands if you did it as an African-American. It, it was considered that you were uppity, that you were showing off. Uh, and of course, uh, oftentimes African-Americans had re rather nice automobiles because they weren't allowed to put any of their money into nice homes. So they, they, they shuttled that money into having Cadillacs and other, other uh, sort of elite mobiles. That's one place where they could spend uh, their money. Uh, as I may have mentioned, uh, blacks were not allowed on the green benches, the famous green benches, which were the symbol of the city. Um, and that, that's been a, 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 a raw subject in recent years because like many people have used the green bench um, a symbol. Uh, there's the Green Bench Brewery. And I, I, years ago, I was given the Green Bench Award by their local Green Bench Society. And, uh, um, uh, but if you talk to African Americans who've lived here uh, since the 40s and the, the enforcement of the local customs stopped um, at the end of the World War II, basically. Um, but before that time, uh, it was very dangerous for a black person to sit on one of those, one of those benches. So it's a, it's a real a raw, a raw subject to say the least. Um, the, uh, there were a whole, whole uh, panoply of, of uh, racial control mechanisms in the city. Um, even though it wasn't a classically, you know, ex or a neo-Confederate city, it was, you know, Florida culture has always been a kind of a bridge between the Caribbean and the Old South. And St. Petersburg was no exception to that. Um, so we had a kind of uh, strange uh, segregation system that combined what we call de jure segregation in law and de facto segregation in custom. De facto was the system that dominated in the North. 
northern cities and northern states didn't have very many Jim Crow laws. They did have segregation. People knew where they could go and where they couldn't go, but it wasn't established in law. In the South, it was almost always, after 1900 at least, a de jure system. Well, in St. Petersburg was kind of a mix of this, uh, of law and, and, and custom. Um, so the residential segregation here, as in many cities, was, was maintained through restrictive covenants, which were declared illegal by the Supreme Court in 1948. But before that, um, that was the main means of keeping African-Americans out of the more desirable neighborhoods. Uh, if, if you live in one of those neighborhoods today, if you look on your deed, as I could and on my deed in Allendale, it says I cannot sell my house to any, to African-Americans, to Asians, to Native Americans, to Jews. The restrictions are on and on. Um, now those haven't been in force uh, since 1948, but the, the neighborhood structure of the city was established largely by restrictive uh, covenants. In fact, in 1936, uh, the city council pa passed a resolution, an ordinance setting up an apartheid district, 17 blocks uh, long, uh, where all blacks in the, at some point in the future would have to move to live in that set, or they could only live in that system, like a South African homeland. Well, that, of course, was at the height of the Depression, and for the, the city was bankrupt. They never had the money to, to carry this out. It's, it's I think, instructive that they, try, they, they thought about doing it, but, of course, what, what led them astray is that they'd always, uh, I think, believed their own propaganda that the city was only 9% Black when it was actually 23%. So there was no way in the world that the Black population could fit into that apartheid area. So it never happened, but I think it tells you a lot about the nature of race relations in the 1930s, that that in fact happened. Uh, there was also a lot of disfranchisement, um, uh, use of white primaries, the poll tax, literacy uh, tax and that sort of thing was never as, as effective here. Blacks always voted uh, more often here than, than in almost any other Florida city. It's really interesting. Uh, but there were, there were attempts many times to try to create a, a a white primary, uh, and they, they were able to do it in the Democratic Party. So the primaries were white, but in the general elections, blacks always managed to vote here uh, and uh, had a, a, bit, a bit of political, uh, political power. Um, beyond disfranchisement, of course, there was, a, uh, there was the resort to lynchings, to kind of vigilante justice, uh, supposedly representing the will of the community. And there were two uh, quite famous lynchings in St. Petersburg. The first was in 1905. Uh, John Thomas uh, was a, a black from South Carolina, actually, who came into the city and he got in a fight with the pol police chief. It was on Christmas Day, actually, and he, he killed the police chief. Um, but, uh, uh, and they put him in jail, but then they, of course, they, they, the mob forced themselves in and they, they, they lynched him, a brutal, brutal lynching. Um, uh, nine years later, in 1914, John Evans uh, was accused of uh, killing a, a, a local a photographer from Philadelphia, who was a kind of an investor. Uh, and uh, it was really a horrific uh, kind of milestone in the city's history. Uh, reportedly, more than half of the city's population was present for the lynching, which was on Martin Luther King and about 2nd Avenue North. They, they, they strung John Evans up to a, a telephone pole and uh, riddled his body with bullets and even gave children pointed sticks to point to stab into the body and they sold parts of his body, you know, as souvenirs and it was just a horrific, horrific thing. And ironically, that particular lynching uh, was as far as we can tell was ordered by the coroner's jury, a group of local elites who ordered the lynching because they wanted to prove to the other Philadelphia investors where Edward Sherman had come from that we had law and order here, that, that they could take care of it uh, in a crazy sort of uh, bizarre, ironic, ironic way. Um, in fact, right now, uh, the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, you may have heard of Brian Stevenson, it's a capital crimes uh, um, appeal um, institution in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, very heroic for years, and but now he's gotten into 
uh, doing uh, museums and uh, they, they have a, a, a lynching museum in Montgomery and they're also involved in, in uh, uh, actually helping communities to set up monuments to particular lynchings and St. Petersburg is one of the first cities to do that and later this spring there will be a ceremony, I think Brian Stevens will be here, uh, there will be a monument uh, actually put at the place of the John Evans lynching. These things are always controversial and difficult. Uh, most communities don't really want to commemorate some of the darker moments of their past, but uh, I, I think uh, it's very important to, that we don't forget uh, things like this. Um, the, the city also had uh, a fairly uh, well-established uh, Ku Klux Klan uh, clavern, uh, particularly in the 1920s and 30s. Um, Jim Code, who was the executive secretary of the local chamber of commerce, if you can imagine this in 1924, was also the local head of the Ku Klux Klan. And he was responsible for putting a sign up on the Gandhi Bridge just after it opened in 1924 that said, Gentiles only wanted here. No Jews and others allowed. Uh, now they made him take it down the sign. There were other signs like that in other parts of the community. Uh, and he was, he was let go as the head of the Chamber of Commerce, but it tells you something about the power of the Klan. Um, they would have these Right, rather elaborate uh, initiation ceremonies on Pasigril Beach with flaming crosses. And um, it declined in, in the 30s and came back a little bit in, after, after 1954. Um, but uh, I think it's important to realize that we, we didn't escape that. That part of Southern heritage that we sometimes associate with the Deep South was, was, was alive in this, uh, in, in this, in this, in this city. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is the, the role that the police have played um, in the kind of maintaining of the Jim Crow system, uh, rather rigid and sometimes, you know, brutal police enforcement, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the, from 1937 to 1945, there was a notorious police chief here named Doc Vaughn, who would routinely beat prisoners, some, in some cases, to death. He, finally, he went too far uh, beating a woman prisoner in 1944, and they, they let him go in 45, and things got a little better after, after that. Um, but uh, of course, this, is always, this has been a, a subject that has come and gone many times kind of throughout the city's history, and, and most American cities really would that have a substantial uh, black uh, community. Some of you may remember in the early 1990s, uh, Kurt Kurtzinger, was the mayor, he, he uh, not, should be not the mayor, he, was a, he tried to be mayor, he lost, but he, he was the police chief, he came from Los Angeles and he instituted the so-called green teams, which were kind of SWAT teams aimed at, at uh, getting rid of crack houses, but they, they were very aggressive and sometimes they got the wrong houses and there was a lot of resentment to these green teams in, on the South side. Um, and uh, in 1992, Kurt Kurtzinger was fired by Don McRae who was an African-American from an old family in the city, uh, who was the assistant city manager and he fired Kurtzinger and there was tremendous outcry. In 1995, Kurtzinger ran for mayor uh, on, a, on a platform that was, it wasn't openly white supremacist, but he was definitely taking advantage of some of the racial tensions in the city. Uh, I think fortunately he lost to, uh, to David Fisher. Uh, and a year later, of course, there was the Ty Tyrone Lewis case where a young black man, teenager, um, was, was killed by a police officer and it led to a, several nights of rioting and often called the racial disturbances. And uh, uh, it was a pretty rough, rough period for, uh, for at least a week or two. And uh, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference leaders were brought in. Uh, uh, the uh, secretary of uh, the, um, uh, I'm trying to think which which one it was. One of the cabinet members came in to try to mediate, and it was a a bad a bad situation. So the the the, the relationship with the police has always been difficult. Now, fortunately, in recent years, we've actually had two African American police chiefs. The first one was Goliath Davis, and of course now um, we have Anthony Holloway, who was previously the police chief in 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 uh, in uh, Clearwater. Um, so that's what I want to say about uh, racial control. Um, the, another distinctive aspect of the black community and the history here is that 
the economic dependence on the tourist and the winter visitor economy led to patterns of seasonal migration. So some of St. Petersburg's black citizens, many of them actually would leave in the summer and they would work in Northern resorts as far North as Connecticut and New York and, and New Jersey. And uh, there was also somewhat of a smaller middle class uh, than in most Southern cities, black middle class. Um, uh, although it, it had its strength and I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, uh, and there, there was, however, compared to many Southern cities, there was less dire poverty uh, and uh, less chronic unemployment than you found in, in deep, south, deep South cities. Uh, but it was no picnic. I mean, there was a, a st study done in 1940 uh, of the black community of St. Petersburg. Um, and 59% uh, uh, of black households uh, had uh, no electricity. That's 1940. And that's compared to 2% of the white, white households. 17.6% had no running water um, compared to 0.5% uh, among whites. Uh, only 18.5% of the blacks owned homes in 1940. Uh, and there were no black lawyers. There were two black doctors um, in the entire, in the entire in the entire um, city. Um, there was a small medical facility, Mercy Hospital, which was created um, to service blacks because they were generally not welcome in any of the white hospitals. Um, uh, James Ponder was a black doctor who was brought into the city in 1926 as the unofficial uh, medical officer for the, for the black community. And uh, that was a, an important uh, advance. Um, so uh, it was, even though you didn't have quite the, the tar paper shacks that you had in some other cities, uh, there were slum lords, there were slums. Um, uh, there was, however, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, more suffrage and electoral power than in other Florida cities. Uh, there was a, a nascent two-party system uh, in, the, in the late 1940s. Uh, there were early interracial efforts at reform beginning in the 1930s, uh, centering around the YWCA, uh, ministerial associations, the League of Women Voters. Um, and so there was a kind of a nascent civil rights movement. It, it really begins in, in, in 1938, uh, when the principal of Gibbs High School, uh, Noah Griffin, uh, was a very outspoken uh, kind of advocate of black rights. And he was driven out of the city on threat of, uh, of being murdered and he had, had to go to California. In 1939, there was a local minister, black minister, uh, Reverend John Wesley Carter, who went before the city council very bravely and argued for a, a black new deal, trying to bring some of the, the uh, sort of governmental services that the new deal had uh, advocated to the, to, to the black community. He didn't get anywhere. They, they listened to him politely, but sort of ignored him after that. And then in 1940, um, after the Wagner-Steagall Act of 1937 made it possible for cities to have, get federal money for public housing, St. Pete was one of the first cities to, to get that money and they, they built Jordan Park. They built the first um, phase in 1939, uh, I think 240 um, units on, on land donated by Elder Jordan, who was the wealthiest African-American in the city, who had his own bus line and uh, quite an entrepreneur. Uh, he owned that land where Jordan Park is today, which is right next to where, where the, the Woodson Museum is. Of course, the Woodson Museum used to be the community center of Jordan, Jordan Park. Well, the, the first part of Jordan Park was so successful, they wanted to build a second phase. And that's when the slumlords mobilized all of their political supporters on the city council and elsewhere to try to stop it. And that brought in the League of Women Voters, particularly, and the YWCA, and there was an interracial coalition, the first time it ever happened in the city. Uh, and they forced the city council to, to order a referendum on whether they could build phase two. And uh, it was an extraordinary effort, blacks and whites working together, uh, a kind of a you know, uh, prefatory to what's gonna happen later in the civil rights movement here, and they won they were able to defeat the slumlords and the second phase was built uh, in, in 1940 and, and, and 40, 41. 
Um, so that's a, a major milestone in the city's history. Um, later in the 40s, there was a big movement to equalize teacher pay. Black teachers made far less than, than white teachers. Uh, the, the black schools had much shorter, of course, terms and uh, had woeful uh, facilities uh, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, terrible, terrible situation. They did the best they could. Um, uh, and in, in, in 1946, there was a local uh, black doctor, Gilbert uh, Leggett uh, and others uh, who were able to, to file suit against the local white primary. This is two years after the Smith versus Allwright decision, which declared the Texas white primary unconstitutional. It was the first great victory of the NAACP in the court. And, but Le Leggett and, and some, several other members of the black community were able to, uh, to, win, to go to the circuit court and win and strike down the white primary. So that was a real kind of, I think a boost of, of confidence um, that uh, you, could, you could have civil rights uh, activity in the city and, and uh, uh, without creating a tremendously violent response. So a local civil rights movement emerged after World War II um, and you had people like Dr. Robert Swain, who was a local dentist, a black dentist, Fred Alsop, uh, a Fisk graduate, uh, Gilbert Leggett, as I mentioned, Ralph Wimbish, uh, a local black doctor and his wife, C. Bet Wimbish, who will later become the first black elected to the city council and she'll become vice mayor of the city in 1969. Um, so uh, with that, I think you start seeing things change uh, in the beginning in the, in the 40s and into the 50s before the classic civil rights movement uh, really gets up and running after the Brown decision of 1954. Um, so you, you get a, a black community that uh, historically I think had been uh, solidified a lot by, by what um, sociologists call negative reference. In other words, they, there was so much oppression outside, they had to sort of band together. But there was a lot of, of positive reference too. There was a vibrant black culture centered around 22nd Street uh, South, the so-called deuces. Uh, John Wilson and Rosalie Peck have written a wonderful book, which you can get at the bookstores in the city about the 22nd Street uh, corridor. Uh, and there were, uh, you know, very impressive uh, black churches. There was the Manhattan Casino, one of the great stops on the, on the so-called Chitlin Circuit, where all the great uh, jazz and blues uh, and pop performers played to the point where whites actually fought their way into the Manhattan Casino. They weren't supposed to go there, but they did because it was far better than the acts that would play at the Coliseum on the in the white in the white community. There was an, a very a powerful Negro baseball league here. The Oliver brothers later ended up in the major leagues, kind of one of the great uh, kind of prides of the city. Gibbs High School, which was created in 1927, out of the shell of a white elementary school they were building, and they finally, the black community, mobilized to get a high school. That was the first high school. Um, and that became a great symbol of pride to the community. There was a vibrant club life. Uh, in the black community. Fannie Mae Ponder, uh, the Dr. James Ponder's wife, who was a very close friend of Mary McLeod Bethune, of course now is in, in Statuary Hall as one of the two representatives of Florida, the great educator um, at Bethune-Cookman and Daytona Beach and all of that. Um, uh, groups like the Modernistics, which was a women's group, the, the Ambassadors Club, which started in 1953. Um, there was just a lot, a lot of things to be, to be proud of. Uh, I think in, in the black community that they were able uh, out of uh, very difficult circumstances to, to uh, there was a great uh, jazz and blues tradition. Um, some of you may be familiar with Al Downing, who was a great musician, uh, Buster Cooper, people who played with, with some of the biggest bands of Count Basie and uh, uh, Duke Ellington and, and things like that. Um, um, so even before the, the classic civil rights era of the 1960s, uh, things were really really uh, changing, I think, for the better. And it, it, it really came mostly out of the, the blood, sweat, and tears of the Black community that they, they were able not only to endure, but I would say even to, 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 to triumph in, in, in many senses. And there, there'll be a lot of bat battles in the future. Uh, I finally got rid of uh, segregation in spring training in 1961, uh, of course, with the Civil Rights Acts of 64, 65, and 68. 
School desegregation doesn't come until 1971, uh, even though the first token desegregation begins in 1962. Uh, James Sanderlin, this very talented black attorney who becomes one of the first black judges in Florida, comes and handles all the NAACP lawsuits uh, for desegregation of the schools, but also um, uh, representing the so-called Courageous 12, which you may have heard of. The, the first black policemen were uh, hired in 1949, but until the mid 60s, they could not arrest white people. They could not patrol white neighborhoods. Uh, uh, it, it was a, and they, they, they didn't make the same salaries as, 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 as white officers. And so they filed a lawsuit and James Sanderlin represented them and they won a great victory in 1965. And there's been recent kind of celebrations, the last, because I think it's only one of the courageous 12 left, but uh, that's just one example of some of the great heroes that um, I think came out of the black community. And so they have a strong sense, an old sense of heritage. And uh, I probably should stop now because we only have a few minutes for, for questions. There's a lot more I wanted to, to say, but I hope I just gave you some sense of the, the distinctive quality of, of, the, of the community here, that it's a, it's a bittersweet story, but I think uh, one that has a great potential to, to um, have uh, better, better days ahead for sure. So thank you. Um, any well, questions, you. comments, anyone? I hope you have some. Ray, I thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking to see if anyone has raised their hands. Uh, no one yet, uh, but I would invite uh, uh, those who, who may have questions for Ray to, uh, to speak up if, um, if you can't find that button. Uh, and please, uh, if you're going to do so, uh, please unmute yourself. Oh, oh, I see Sandra Averett has her hand raised. There you go. <laughs> Hi, Ray. Hi. So fast forward, in your estimation, where are we today? Well, I, you know, I think we've gone through a rough patch the last four years. Uh, you know, a reassertion of white supremacist rhetoric and ugliness and hatred that I, I really thought was in the past, but I was wrong. And I think a lot of people have been shocked by it. And so I think civil rights advocates are regrouping and trying to figure out what to do next. And things like this social justice series, I think are happening all over the country. I, I know many people who uh, since the George Floyd murder and, and, and the Black Lives Matter movement got started that uh, have become energized, politicized, and really asking the right questions about, about race and about white supremacy. And, and so, I mean, ba back in the 60s, uh, early 60s, you know, I've spent a lot of time with the Freedom Riders, writing about them, spending time with them, getting to know them, and they always talk about, and John Lewis, perhaps more than anyone else, talk about the beloved community. That's what they dreamed of in the 60s, that we would reach the beloved community. It was Dr. King's phrase originally. Uh, obviously, we haven't reached the beloved community. Um, I think there's more, more, maybe more, more road, to, more, t more um, distance to go down the freedom road than we ever thought. But I think there are more people than ever of goodwill who are, who are working on these things and trying. And I think St. Petersburg has gone through quite a transformation in the last few decades. It's, it's a much different place than when I moved here in 1980. Um, things like Studio at 620, which is a kind of a meeting ground between the black and white communities and just so many groups and people interested in trying to equalize um, the justice system and just, just life in general. And, and we, we still got a lot of residential segregation to combat and a lot of misunderstandings. I think for some people, the South side is still treated the way darkest Africa used to be treated. You know, it's a place where you don't go. And I think, I, I, you know, I, I personally think it's absolutely foolish. St. Petersburg has one of the lowest crime rates of any large city in the United States. Um, and obviously a, a poor neighborhood is gonna have more crime and it's gonna be more dangerous, but, but uh, um, I, I, I wish more people would um, interact with, um, with their black neighbors. I wish they had more black neighbors, frankly. And I think it is breaking down. It's quite a bit different 
It used to be the only blacks who lived north of Central Avenue lived in, in Methodist Town. Uh, it's not true anymore. So I think, I think that's a very, very good sign. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, but I, but I, I wouldn't minimize the, the obstacles we still have to, we still face. Uh, Ray, we've got a couple questions in the, uh, in the chat. Um, the first one was, uh, were there any white churches active before the civil rights or during civil rights? Uh, there were. Um, there's a, um, there, there, were, there were a couple of white ministers who were very active, who were involved with the Fellowship of Southern Churchmen, which was a group of, of uh, white ministers around the South. They would meet with blacks in secret in the, in, in, at Black Mountain and other places in the North Carolina mountains in the summer. Uh, oftentimes they had to keep this away from their congregations, but there were, there were definitely, uh, uh, what was his name? Walter Karf was a very uh, courageous minister, um, uh, much like Andy Oliver, I think has been in recent years here in the city of Allendale Methodist, um, who really took great, great chances. And uh, one of the things that, that distinguishes St. Peter's, there were, were, there were always contacts across the racial divide you know, it was never completely cut off. There were always whites. I think in part because of the hybrid nature of the population. There were people from all over the world. It was more cosmopolitan and uh, more like what we call a Sunbelt city, not a deep South city. And uh, so there were, there, were, there were always people of goodwill who um, reached across uh, through the YWCA, uh, League of Women Voters, um, and through the churches. The Ministerial Association was really important in, in setting up uh, sort of Connections, so there was never a, a complete lack of communication. Um, uh, but most of the leaders, of course, were were black ministers like John Wesley Carter, and of course Reverend Enoch Davis uh, of, of of Bethel Community Church was there for 50 years, uh, from 1930 to 1984. It was a, really a rock. He did a marvelous book called On the Bethel Trail, which you can find at the library. Talks about his work in civil rights here. Um, but they had they had friends among the among the white ministers. It was one of the one of the kind of avenues for for contact and at least a, a bit of moral support. Uh, although the first time it really shows itself is during the sanitation worker strike of 1968, which of course paralleled the Memphis sanitation worker strike in Memphis, where Dr. King was assassinated. Um, it was a big sanitation worker strike here in '68, which led to a great change in this. City that led to Beth Bet Wimbish, the next year being elected the first black to the city council, and she became vice mayor. They set up uh, kind of a community organizations with, with blacks and whites, community relations uh, things. But there were whites who did literacy, um, uh, education. Not many whites with uh, um, with uh, uh, the, the 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 sanitation workers. Uh, Joe Savage was the great leader. Today the sanitation building its name for Joe Savage. And he was a really heroic, heroic man. But there were a lot of whites who sympathized with the sanitation workers strike. Um, and that's one of the great kind of uh, turning points as was of course the, the famous mural incident at City Hall in December of 1966 when Joe Waller tore down the mural and ran through the streets and was arrested and spent two and a half years in prison and uh, um, be became a, uh, radicalized and became something of a Black Panther, uh, went out to Oakland and came back and now heads up the Uhuru and the African People's Socialist Party, which is also a kind of an element of Black political life uh, in, on the South Side. Um, if you go to the Saturday morning market, you can have a nice breakfast from the, the Uhuru uh, breakfast <laughs> uh, company. Um, but uh, it, it adds a little spice to the politics on the Black side that you have a group of essentially black separatists who are, are uh, uh, in, in a sense, kind of political revolutionaries. And um, of course, uh, uh, Joe Waller is now named Omali Yeshitela, quite, quite different. Um, but his sister, Alvalita Donaldson, she, she married one, one, one of John Donaldson's great grandchildren. So it goes back to the origins of the city, the Donaldson family back in 1868. All right, we've got one more question in the chat. Uh, are there any models or religious institutions working on social justice in St. Petersburg that we could emulate? Well, I mentioned already Allendale Methodist. Uh, uh, last year, uh, the local chapter of the ACLU, we gave our, 
our major award, the Gardner Beckett Award to Andy Oliver, uh, he has turned that church into a haven for social justice discussions. Uh, I mean, anybody who wants to hold a forum or a meeting, um, of course, he he was uh, has been a beleaguered uh, pastor. Uh, some members of, of his uh, the Methodist uh, denomination wanted him to be defrocked because he he performed a, a same sex marriage uh, before the, there was any kind of sanction or approval from upper authorities. And he but he's hung on and he's become a great uh, I think symbol to many people in the city. Um, that church has thrived, I think, because of Andy Oliver's um, uh, leadership. And I, I would say anybody who can do half of what he has done, uh, he's been absolutely heroic. But of course, there have been others in mean, Lake, 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 you know, Lakeview uh, Presbyterian. Um, uh, there's a United uh, Church of Christ on the South Side that, that, that was long involved in, in uh, social justice activities, anti-war activities. Of course, the Quaker meeting in Southeast St. Pete has, has a long history of, of uh, social justice activity. Uh, they used to have the, the annual uh, Circus McGurkis celebration at the end of October, uh, which was a kind of all, all, all purpose uh, social justice and all things 60s. Uh, you felt like you were in Berkeley in 1965 again when you went to Circus McGurkis, but it, it was a it gave it gave a real nice touch, I think, to the city's uh, diversity. But I think Allendale Methodist is the best example okay. uh, that I I would I would love to think that that our church could uh, uh, begin to do more of that. Um, um, not that we haven't done a lot, but I think uh, he's been a uh, you know a singular model, I think, for for um, for putting a congregation, you know. Sort of on, on the line, really, uh, it's, it's really been quite extraordinary. Okay, I've got another question that came through the chat. Uh, this one, uh, I've heard that the uh, bridge group was created in part by FPC St. Petersburg in the 1960s. Uh, can you speak to their efforts in integration? You know, I don't know anything about that. I must say, I must confess, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I've heard about it and uh, I've gotten some emails from, from them. Uh, over the years, um, but I, I really don't. I really don't know about the lineage of it. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it exists, and um, you know, I know that um, that the church has was been active in with, of course, with Why Mama and uh, with migrant labor and with the homeless, and uh, you know, with a lot of a lot of a lot of good activities. Uh, but I don't know where the the bridge uh, institution fits in. I guess they, is that what uh, ne next week's session is going to concern itself with to some um, degree? No, next week is a, uh, a uh, discussion book, about a book. The book, which is, uses the same word, but yes. it's different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I see Sandy Averett's hand is still raised. I don't know if that's a second question. No, I'm good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Um, all right, so that is the uh, the questions we've had thus far. Uh, oh, there's oh, a you need um, hi. Oh, hey, thanks, Ray. This was wonderful. I, I really learned a lot, not being a native of Florida or St. Petersburg, although my cousins live in Clearwater and, mm -hmm. and Mark, but St. Petersburg is a place apart from there. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that I actually can do a little bit of research on the bridge group because I know a little bit about it, but not enough to talk about it tonight, <laughs> but it'll be something that um, we on the social justice task force can do some research about. Okay. Well, that's great. That's great. I, I look forward to learning more. Um, yeah, St. Pete uh, was, uh, FPC was very, very active, but, you know, I have kind of a hazy understanding and I wouldn't want to say what I know without being accurate, but we'll do some research. Well, I don't know anything about the bridge group. Huh? Hmm. Who was talking? Sorry. Well, I look forward to learning more. I really, um, anything that, any, that we can do along those lines is so welcome. I think 
right now everybody's nerves are so jangled and uh, during the COVID crisis and with what happened at the Capitol and all the crazy stuff that's been going on in recent years. And so I think um, we, we all need some way to have a fresh start <laughs> um, to uh, maybe start moving toward the beloved community again in a, in a real in a real way. I'm so sad that we lost John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and T.T. Vivian and Joseph Lowry. It's they've been dropping like flies. A lot of my the Freedom Riders have been dying in the last year, and but I think the spirit is still there. I'm just so struck by um, uh, the, the things I've experienced with my students. Honestly, I, I always dreamed that there would be that spirit would rise again in terms of. Uh, kind of creative citizenship and uh, activism and a sense of responsibility. And I, I can see that in, in many of my students. They want so much to be involved in something larger than themselves. Okay. What uh, we sometimes call movement culture uh, that can be so transformative, um, and which, which it was for groups like the Freedom Riders and many people involved in the civil rights movement. And I think in Black Lives Matter, has um, um, revived a lot of that. I, when, I, when I was at the 50th anniversary of the Selma and Montgomery March, I was too young to make the original march, but I was sure I wanted to be there for the 50th. And I had the great privilege, opportunity to spend a couple of hours with a number of the uh, Black Lives Matter leaders, the young ones from Ferguson, Missouri, uh, Bernard Lafayette, who's a one of the most famous of Dr. King's apostles and uh, one of the leading nonviolent theorists in the world. Uh, he asked me to come in with him. I'd known him for many years from interviewing him and getting to know him when I was writing about the Freedom Riders. Anyway, we met with those, those young people and uh, the idea was we, we were supposed to tell them what they could learn from the history of the Freedom Rides and the movement uh, what tips could we give them? And uh, beyond telling them, telling them that there's a difference between a protest and a movement, that a movement requires discipline and training and restraint and careful thinking, and um, uh, which I think they already knew that. And I, I, I swear in, in that those two hours that we spent with those Black Lives Matter leaders, I know that Bernard and I learned more from them than they learned from us. It was, it was so heartening to see how sophisticated they were in their understandings of what, what was wrong and what needed to be done. That it was just gave me great hope for the future. Wow. Ray, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for doing this for us tonight. Uh, I know we all appreciate this. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, you know, this is a, a great kickoff uh, to, for our education and our understanding. And and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get that discipline to have our own movement. Sounds great. Okay, um, at this time, I'd like uh, Unita to offer our closing prayer. Wow, thank you so much everybody for being here. And we're looking forward to hearing from you because we need more help, more support. I see Gay here and we're open-ended and, and we're not um, requiring meetings, just so you know, so. May we bow our heads. Almighty and everlasting God who sees every day, event, and eon, we ask your mercy and abundant grace. We know that all earthly kingdoms are but a whisper compared to the sweep of your reign in the cosmos. Those of us who inhabit this land, we the people of the United States, call on you in this moment of travail. Safeguard our commitment to form a more perfect union and protect each citizen in this hour. Grant that we will draw together in an effort to establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility. Form us together that we may promote the general welfare and live as beloved community. 
God who is good and our delight, make us agents of the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Emmanuel, be with us. Amen. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you all very much for your attention and patience. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Ray. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you, everybody, who helped put this together. I see you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Kyle. So long for now. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, Ray. Doug, for coming. Thank you, thank, Doug. Thank you, you Unita. Thank, thank you, you Unita, for inviting me. Oh, you're so welcome. I'll keep you in the loop. I, that's, that is great. This, I, was, I was really impressed and sorry that I didn't get on earlier, but um, that's the way it had to be. But, um, uh, you know, way to go. Uh, I, Doug is my friend from the book club that I'm in and um, a retired yeah. pastor and um, at FPC Sarasota and is a right. wonderful person. We, we just are blessed that he's with us tonight. Such a wow. lovely I'm happy Welcome, to see Doug. You. There's a lot to think about. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so long for Bye. now. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Oh, that was quite a well.